Welcome to the Veritas Podcast, the weekly show where we study and discuss papal writings of the Catholic Church. Hello, welcome to the Veritas Podcast. This is Robert Kassman, he's Robert Sisko, as always. The previous episode, we discussed paragraphs 9 and 10, we looked at the technique of the modernists and how they discount miracles of Christ. Modernists claim that people of faith have added a religious sense to Christ, and that is how faith has developed. Pius dealt with this accordingly with the appropriate anathema. So in our current episode, we hope to get through at least paragraph 11. Pius brings the intellect into the discussion of the modernists. Before we get forward, though, Rob, in a succinct and down-to-earth manner, can you explain the intellect and its relationship to emotions, and what does it have to do with this discussion about modernism? The, the purpose of the intellect is to know the truth. So if you were to ask, what's the purpose of the eyes, the purpose of our eyes are to see, the purpose of our ears are to hear, well, the purpose of the intellect is to know the truth. That's what it's made for. So we would say then that the object of the intellect is truth. That's the intellect. The will, the object of the will, what the will is made for is good. So the intellect is made for truth. The will is made for good. And the will does two things. It has two functions. It desires and it chooses. But the will is a blind faculty, which means it can't discern a true good from a false or merely apparent good. That's why, for example, uh, people desire drugs or other things, even though they know they're bad for them, they still have a desire, because our desires are blind. They're not necessarily subject to our reason as they should be. So these people, they know with their intellect that the drugs are bad, but they still desire the drugs for the good feeling that it gives or or to rid themselves of the bad feeling they have without them. So there's always some kind of good the will is looking for, but again, it's blind. So it needs something then to direct it in its choice. Remember, it does two things. It desires, that's one thing, and it also chooses. The desires are blind. The choice, it needs something to guide it in its choice. The will can't just choose what it desires. It needs to choose a true good. And the thing that directs the will and its choice is the intellect. That's the job of the intellect. It's to direct the will so that it chooses a true good as opposed to a merely apparent good. So since the intellect judges truth, it's able to discern or judge the true good, then it directs the will in its choice. So the freedom of choice, it stands midway between the lower desires of our the desires of our lower nature, our sensitive appetites, and the judgment of the intellect, the uh, rational appetite. The, the choice stands midway between the two, and it's ideally supposed to choose what the intellect proposes. And this is now also the battle between the flesh and the spirit that St. Paul talks about. That's what that's a battle between. It's a battle of the will choosing between the disordered tendencies, pleasure that it shouldn't have, and a judgment of the reason. So that's that's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And since the will is free in its choice, it can choose either one. So that's the intellect and the will. Um, the intellect seeks and knows the truth. The will desires and chooses the good. And one of the first questions in the catechism is, why did God make us? And the answer is, God made us to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this life so that we can then be happy with him in the next. We come to know God and his commandments with our intellect. That's the function of the intellect. And then we love and serve God with our wills. Those two apply to the will. So we can't love something unless we first know it. So the knowledge of God precedes the love of God. Again, because we can't love something unless we know it. So the knowledge of the God, the intellect, precedes the love of God. And it's our actions, what we do, that proves our true love for God over created things. And that's why in John chapter 14, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that love me. So it's important to know that knowledge comes first. 
We have to know the commandments first. That's the object of the intellect. Then we obey the commandments, which pertains to the will. But as we're going to see from modernism, everything begins with the feelings, with the heart, with the emotions, and not the intellect. And the feelings, the emotions, they are not governed by they are not governed by the intellect, they're not governed by truth. Emotions can come from anywhere. Good music can cause emotions. Um, God can also give good feelings. He can give consolations. We all have consolations from time to time. They can come from God, but they can also come from natural things, and they can also come from the devil. And we'll discuss later on maybe some examples of how we see the devil in certain saints who cause these emotions that try to try to lead them astray by these. So we have to be governed primarily by our intellect to govern our will and also to govern or at least judge our emotions. And Rob, that's a really excellent point about the knowledge preceding love. Modernists, and we're going to see in a minute with Pius, he, he describes this, they got it completely backwards as they have with everything, of course, but because this is a full philosophical problem, if they have this point backwards, they have their whole life backwards. And so they have this feeling, and then they attempt to describe it. And we'll see that that's kind of related to Protestantism as well. Exactly right. Everything starts with the feeling. Instead of starting with the intellect, where we accept the truths God has revealed, and then try to live our life best we can according to those truths, it rejects that, and it starts with man's feelings. So man has these warm, fuzzy feelings inside, and that's where everything begins for a modernist. That's why they're always so confused intellectually. Yeah, and, and because they don't really want the truth. Uh, the intellect is responsible for seeking the truth. They don't really want to know the truth with whatever it is, whether it's a specific uh, um, sinful behavior or or a philosophical issue we've been discussing on this podcast. They don't really want to know it. They just want to experience. Yes. Matter of fact, we've hear, heard Pope Francis repeatedly come out against ideologies whether it's the Marxist ideology or even the Catholic ideology. He's against ideology in general. Well, ideology, that's of the intellect. The Catholic faith is an ideology. It's something that we adhere to with our intellect. But he's all about just, you know, just doing good, or there's nothing wrong with doing good. We're supposed to do good. But you can see in Pope Francis, he has a real issue with, with truth, with dogma which he calls an ideology. So you can see that um, in what Pope Francis has been, has been doing and saying lately. And if you know how modernists think, then the words and the actions of Pope Francis make a lot of sense, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. All right, let's go on and get started then. In paragraph 11, Pius writes, quote, In that sense of which we have frequently spoken, since sense is not knowledge, they say God, indeed, presents himself to man, but in a manner so confused and indistinct that he can hardly be perceived by the believer. It is therefore necessary that a certain light should be cast upon this sense, so that God may clearly stand out in relief and be set apart from it. This is the task of the intellect, whose office it is to reflect and analyze, and by means of it, man first transforms into mental pictures the vital phenomena which arise within him, and then expresses them in words. Hence, the common saying of modernists, that the religious man must think his faith, end of quote. And Rob, I've noticed this too, and I don't know if some listeners might have this issue, but some of the difficulty with all older encyclicals is just the style of writing. Sometimes people not, might not know what he means. Here, Pius is, for the most part, speaking about how modernists think and how they view. Modernists do not see God from knowledge of him, but think that God is only experienced from this religious sentimentality. Modernists think that believers experience God through feelings and then use their intellect to explain or give meaning to those feelings, as we were just discussing. Modernists think that believers interpret this experience into mental pictures, and no wonder there is this indistinction and confusion among them. If God does not come from knowledge and only from emotions, then there will most certainly be confusion. And what comes to mind, of course, is Protestant denominations, they're certainly confused. There's thousands of them all the time. Much of their beliefs are based on this sentimentality, this uh, religious experience, Pentecostal uh, feelings. So to a certain extent, the modernists are correct, except only if they're describing Protestants. So instead of man arriving at the knowledge of God by believing what he's revealed, 
which is the act of the intellect, they say man comes to the knowledge of God basically by listening to their feelings. And they'll, they'll use terms today, you'll hear it often, terms like an encounter with God. They want to have an encounter with God. The truth for them comes from within. And the purpose of the intellect then is just to um, just to articulate what they experienced within from this so-called encounter, you see. But the problem is that our feelings and our sentiments are not the source of truth. And um, they're also not a, a sign of something being true. Good feelings, like we mentioned, they can come from God through consolation. They can also come from the devil, or they can just come from natural natural things, like you know, go have a real good workout at the gym, and you you know you feel pretty good, or your endorphins are released, and you have a good feeling, or drink a cup of coffee, or listen to good music. These things kind of pep you up and give you a good feeling, or go to a pep rally, like in high school, we had pep rallies, and everyone has all this pep rally enthusiasm. Well, that's not the Holy Ghost, but a lot of times people think that this pep rally enthusiasm, like these Protestant churches where they're all singing and dancing around, they think their pep rally enthusiasm enthusiasm is the Holy Ghost, and that's evidence of the Holy Ghost. But these feelings, these emotions, enthusiasm, that's in no way necessarily an evidence of of God at all. And the devil also uses he'll use feelings or even mystical experiences as a means of leading people astray. He actually got St. Ignatius of Loyola this way. St. Ignatius was a soldier, uh, kind of a worldly soldier. He got injured in battle. He was laid up in bed for months, went through a huge conversion. It's a really interesting story. Went through a huge conversion and then went to go live in a cave after his conversion. Did penance, had all kinds of true mystical experiences in a cave, but he also had some false mystical experiences from the devil. They, he would be up all night in just this ecstasy and these you know, wonderful feelings and prayer all night. But then he began to notice that during the day, he couldn't get his work done. So he was tired and just kind of run down all day, and he couldn't get his work done. And he finally, I'm not sure how he realized, I'm not sure if it was a revelation or how he realized it, but he, he figured out eventually that all those exuberant feelings, those ecstasies at night were actually from the devil. And then so he decided to go to sleep at night, and um, everything got back in order. So the devil tried to use that to lead him astray. And I'll never forget an um, article I read in Catholic Family News years and years ago from a former Hindu who had converted to the Catholic Church. And in the article, he was explaining how in the Hindu religion, they also have all these false mystical experiences, these it's, um, ecstasies and all these feelings. It's just like what we see today in the charismatic movement. He described the same thing, and that's all I could think of when I was reading that article, is the charismatic movement, because they're also everything in the charismatic movement is based on feelings and the enthusiasm and uh, you know the joy and all this they think is the Holy Ghost, but... Um, you, you can't judge something just based on the feelings and emotion. You have to let the intellect, the truth, be the ultimate judge. And if you judge the charismatic movement based on the faith, it fails. It comes up short. The charismatic movement began in Protestantism. It's a Protestant movement that unfortunately worked its way into the Catholic Church without giving up its, its Protestant doctrine. So you still have these Protestant heresies, and you have Catholics who get involved in this, and then start to gradually embrace these, these Protestant errors, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, this new sacrament they're supposed to have. So the point is the feelings, they are no guide of the truth, and the feelings are no sign, no evidence of something being true. The devil can certainly cause, um, cause these preternatural feelings. And no, Rob, out- yeah, go ahead. Hold on a minute. Be- yeah, before you get to let me interject real quick. I want to ask you... Um, a couple of ways maybe a Catholic can determine if an emotion or a so-called ecstasy is from Christ or not. But before I ask you that, uh, one has to ask himself or herself, if I'm being slain in the Spirit or I'm uh, passing out by being you know, blessed on the forehead or, or, or whatever the experience is, how does this help Christ in his mission and his church? Are believers brought to the church from this? Are people saved? Do people go to confession because they see people passing out in these events? And so, for me anyway, one way to answer my own question would be, 
does this lead me closer to heaven or farther away from it? Does this lead people around me closer to heaven or farther away? So, for me, uh, if I read a spiritual book, Imitation of Christ, does that help me get closer to Christ or not? And the answer is obvious. So, that's how I ask myself. And so, if it's a television show, does this help me get closer to Christ or farther away? Same thing with this. But, Rob, let me ask that question to you. What's another way that a good person can determine if this is from uh, God or from the devil? There is um, actually 17 signs of the good spirit at work, the angel at work, and there's 17 or so signs of the diabolical spirit. I don't have those here with me, but I know that the first sign is the doctrine. You look at doctrine first, like on a Revelation, Medjugorje or something. First, you see if it lines up with doctrine. That's the first thing you look at. But then there's also other signs also. Um, St. Ignatius, which is mentioned, when he was in that cave, he was visited by the Blessed Mother, and she also gave him um, rules for discerning the spirit. It's rules for discerning the good spirit versus the bad spirit. And the, at first, what the devil will do, he'll try to lead someone to sin. He'll lead them to sin at first, but then after someone has kind of got beyond that, what he will do, he'll try to lead them astray by good. He won't tempt them to to sin, something they know is bad. He'll tempt them, tempt them under the appearance of good. So that we get to the charismatic movement. It appears to be good. Someone could see it's maybe it's good. You have people who are you know going to church and they're and they're all happy and having a great time, but the doctrine is false. It leads them away by false doctrines. So. And it also is all focused on the emotions. What if you had someone who was really into the charismatic movement who went through a period of dryness? Dryness is common in the spiritual life. It's actually part of the advancement in the spiritual life when God withdraws these feelings. Because if you're only going somewhere for the feelings, well, you're going there really for yourself. It's what you get. It's the feelings that you get out of it. You see, you, of course, you're going to convince yourself that God giving these feelings, but in reality, you're going there just getting these feelings. You almost need your latest fix at this movement. Or what if God withdraws these feelings? Or what if these feelings stop? What's going to happen then? Are they going to think that God's abandoned them? Probably so. If everything is founded on feelings, that's probably what they would assume. Um, but to answer the question, I would need to look up those 17 rules. Um, but the first rule I know is truth. Is it true? Look at the charismatic movement. It originated in Protestantism around 1901 or so. It's based on false doctrine, based on slain in the spirit. Things you're not going to find anywhere in the history of the church, this speaking in the false speaking in tongues where they speak in gibberish. The real speaking of tongues is what we see in Acts chapter 2 which not only happened in Acts chapter 2, it happened throughout the history of the church. It happened to Mary of Agrita. That's where the apostles need to preach the gospel to people of other languages. Well, how does, how does that work? How can they go preach to people all over the world in these foreign languages? They speak in tongues, and that means they speak in their language, but the people understand them in their own language. So it's, it's the opposite of gibberish. It's the apostles speaking their language, and the other people, people miraculously understanding them in their own language. That's the real speaking in tongues. Mary of Agrita had the same thing. She bilocated to eastern Texas in the 16, what's now known as eastern Texas, in the 1600s, and she preached to the Indians at the time, and she converted them. And there's a very interesting story, but she, she spoke in her language, she was Spanish, and they understood them, understood her in their language. Um, so that's another thing is the false speaking in tongues. It's interesting if you read the article in the encyclopedia on New Advent under, I think it's called Galicia or Galicia, which is the speaking in tongues. It discusses this false speaking in tongues, this gibberish that had originated just before this article was written in Protestantism. It's interesting to read what it says about that. Um, but to answer the question, the first thing is to look for doctrine. Is the doctrine true? That's what you look at first. You don't just look for the feelings. Uh, that's a really good point as well. And we might be able to uh, provide a link to a couple of those uh, issues that Rob was just discussing. And Rob, one more thing before we go further. It's pretty interesting that you talked about the pep rallies and the feelings you get out of it. A lot of times we'll hear that people fall away from the church or the, you know, the Catholic Church or the Baptist Church, whatever it may be, because, quote, I wasn't getting anything from it. 
and I can say that um, half the time I pray the family rosary with all my children, not getting anything out of it, that kind of stuff. But what I end up having to force myself to do is just to sit with my intellect, and especially with my will, just to do it, because I know that it's good and it's right. Or going to Mass in the morning, or whatever the case may be. So sometimes it's not just, in fact, sometimes the emotion will never be there. You just have to do what you have to do. Yeah, we have to do the right thing. And a lot of times the right thing is not going to be the thing that feels the best or that we desire. We have to do the right thing. We can't base it on our feelings. Now, God will send us consolations, though. We'll get consolations from time to time. But we can't be out searching for these consolations, these feelings, and then think that when we find the feeling, that's that's where we need to go in that direction. That's, um, that is not the thing to do in our day. Matter of fact, Our Lady of La Salette, which is an approved apparition, she spoke of the signs and wonders that's going to be taking place in our day, these false signs and wonders that God's going to permit in our day. And she said, um, she warned that, it's actually the Blessed Mother talking, said the Pope needs to warn people in this day about miracles and about signs and wonders, because the devil's going to have the power to produce these lying wonders, which is what uh, the Bible calls them, which are, the lying wonders are preternatural things that to us, it looks like a miracle, because we couldn't do it. To us, it's a miracle, like maybe a, say a chair moved across the room with no one touching it. Wow, that looks miraculous to us, but, you know, a demon can easily move a chair. Demons can do things that appear to us miraculous. So those are what the lying wonders are. They're things that the demons can do that look like miracles to us. So we have to be on guard against that. There was also a quote from Pius X where he also said, um, beware of miracles. In our day today, beware of miracles because of the extra power the devil is going to be granted to the devil to deceive people in this day. That reminds me of the uh, vision of Leo XIII. He just finished saying Mass, and he had a vision, or at least he had a vision. He also heard the devil approach the throne of God and tell God, I can destroy your church. Jesus replied and said, okay, um, go ahead and try. And the devil said, but I need more time, and I need more power over those who will give themselves to my service. And Jesus replied, okay, you have the time, and you have the power. And then it said he was given a hundred years then to try to destroy the church. And when Leo XIII had that vision and heard that, he actually fell over and passed out. They brought him back, and he went into his office right away and penned the St. Michael prayer, the the long original version of the St. Michael prayer, which talks about the devil entering into the church and kind of destroying, trying to destroy the church uh, from within. So, yeah, in our day, we have to be real careful with all these preternatural events because that God has permitted the devil to have extra power in our day to try to deceive um, people through those means for those who will not adhere to the truth. So if you adhere to the truth, you're going to be on safe ground. But if you just follow the emotions and the signs and wonders, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be led down the wrong road in this day. Yeah, it'll definitely be in danger. Uh, before we end this episode, I actually found uh, uh, one of the things we were talking about, about speaking in tongues, and I will provide a link to this as well. But from the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, it reads, the charism had deteriorated, and he's talking about St. Paul here in the Corinthians, into a mixture of meaningless, inarticulate gabble with an element of uncertain sounds, which sometimes might be construed as little short of blasphemous. Yes. Now, he also says in there that because the charismatics, they don't point to Acts chapter 2 where the apostles spoke in their own language and it was interpreted in the language of the others. They point to 1 Corinthians 14, which is what he's talking about there, as, as being the evidence of what they do, as the evidence of what they do. But in that article it says, look, St. Paul never says that what they're doing is from God. He never says this gibberish is from God, which is an important point. That, that's what I was getting at when I mentioned that article. Absolutely. Okay, well, Rob, let's end this episode with that thought, and we'll go on to paragraph 12 for the next episode. So if you're still with us, I know this is some pretty heavy stuff. We've been discussing a lot of metaphysics. It's well worth it, though. It's it's a pretty hard encyclical to get through. So just stick with us, and I think it'll make a little more sense. 